let's begin our first seminar. This will be given by Carmen Abia Sant, who is a either first or second year student. First. First, first year student. And um, she will present the team that she's working with. I'll simply uh, give you the, the title of her presentation, which is Tailoring of New Perovskites for Solar Cells. Okay, Carmen, please begin. Well, thank you, Henry. Thanks everyone for joining in. And I'm going to be talking about my project. Uh, so, and again, I'm a first year uh, PhD student. And my project is about um, essentially crystallography on perovskites for solar cells. And in general lines, the project includes uh, three parts. So um, synthesizing the samples, uh, study um, the samples, extra, the structure of the samples with X-ray and neutron diffraction, and finally characterize them um, to see the optoelectrical properties for solar cells. Um, so before I start, uh, I have to mention that this is a collaboration project between the ILL, with Maria Teresa, my supervisor, and the Instituto de Ciencias de Materiales de Madrid, which is um, the institute that research the um, physics and the um, science uh, behind the materials um, in the Spanish National uh, Research uh, Council. Um, moreover, in the ILL, I can with the help with Laura that helps me with the single crystal uh, data treatment and, of course, uh, um, in the experiments. And with Consuelo, Carlos, and Andres that help me with uh, the optical electrical characterization. So this is uh, the outline that I'm going to be following. I'm going to start with a little bit of background information um, to motivate why we're doing this project. Then I will set the objectives that we have. Then I will explain all the experimental methods that we use from, again, the synthesis of the crystals to the um, electro-optical characterization. And then I will show three sets um, of samples from which we have like a complete overview and results that make um, a complete uh, picture of, of the samples. And I will finish with some summary and conclusions. So, of course, um, I guess it is, it's no secret for any of us that nowadays, the way that we live in, um, everything we do is best based on energy conversion from one energy from form to another. That is, of course, a problem nowadays because um, um, the first problem is that we keep increasing and increasing the demand because of the increased population and uh, because of the life standards that are also increasing. Then we have a second problem, that is that uh, we're currently relying on fossil fuels. So we're consuming non-renewable energy resources. So that is, of course, an issue because we're running out of them. And third of the third problem, the third issue that this situation um, has is that um, these non-renewable energy, energy resources uh, produce uh, greenhouse uh, gases that, of course, contribute to global warming and pollution and so on. So this situation leads us to look for alternative energy resources. And in particular, in the past few years, a lot of effort has been put in, develop, uh, in developing like new photovoltaic technology, like is the case of solar cells. So at the moment, um, we cl can classify the solar cells in three generations, depending on the link between the um, conversion, the conversion efficiency and the cost. The first uh, generation of the perovskites are the ones that we're most familiar with. So like the ones that we see around, they, they take 90% of the market. And that is uh, the ones that are based on crystalline silicon. They're based on bulk materials, so they are quite, um, like they're very efficient. However, although there's a lot of silicon at the moment, uh, the manufacturing process is very expensive. So that's what it makes it, um, a lot like this generation is very unaffordable in general. Then there's a second generation of solar cells um, that is based on thin films. Again, there's less material, so it's a, a cheaper, cheaper manufacturing uh, process. However, because there's less material, there are more defects, and that it makes the efficiency a little bit worse. And that leads us to the third generation. Uh, which are the emerging uh, photovoltaics. So uh, there's uh, still undergoing research to put this um, generation of solar cells in the market. However, they are very promising because they offer, in principle, high efficiencies and uh, cheap uh, costs, like very uh, small price. 
Um, and that is the case of my hybrid um, perovskites, organ organic and inorganic perovskites. So I keep talking about perovskites, but I have not said what they actually are. So it's essentially any material, any crystal that follows the mineral perovskite um, crystal structure, if that makes sense. Um, so of course, the lattice arrangement uh, can be a little bit different, but as we see it in the slide, we uh, show um, a square cubic, uh, so cubic um, faced uh, perovskite. In the middle, we have an organic which can be also inorganic, but we'll get to that later. Um, cation in the middle. And then in the corners, we have uh, big inorganic cations, usually a metal. And uh, in the middle of the faces, we have uh, smaller, slightly smaller halogen anions. So that the um, big um, inorganic cations are octahedrically coordinated with the X atoms. Um, these are the methyl ammonium and formamidinum, which are two organic molecules that, we, I, that I used so far in the synthesis of my perovskites. So these two molecules would be in the center. Another key point of the perovskites is that they offer uh, great flexibility in the, um, in the composition. So depending on the atoms that we decide to put in, a, in our perovskite, we would get um, different properties. So this is something that we need to, to have in mind. However, um, not all these perovskites um, have the perfect cubic um, form. Um, and that can be estimated uh, with the Goldsmith uh, tolerance factor. So the lower the, the lower the number, this number is, um, the lower symmetry our system would have. And this only depends on the ionic ready of the elements that confirm the perovskite. So uh, again, um, this flexibility of the composition would affect the structure directly, and that would lead to different properties. Um, and the loose part of the, um, we'll get to in other slides, but we get the loose part of the symmetry uh, because of the octahedral tilting um, of the octahedral symmetries at the corners. So why do we need perovskite for solar cells? Um, so it all started with the, what is called MAPI perovskites, which is methyl ammonium lead uh, three um, iodine, iodine, which of course presents um, well, all the advantages that we want for a solar cell to have are reaching like power conversion efficiencies of up to 23%. However, they have two major drawbacks. That is that they contain lead, uh, which is obviously a problem if you want to put it into the, in the market. And they degradate and they are low tolerance to moisture. So that sets um, a few, the first few general objectives of my period, which is exploring new chemistry. So that we can reach and like this point where like, the, has the best characteristic for solar cells and uh, hopefully improve the stability somehow and also uh, do further crystallography research because it's not much done um, with neutron especially and that will lead me to the next slide which is uh, more specific in terms of objectives that uh, is with neutron scattering and x-ray diffraction uh, neutron diffraction sorry and um, x-ray diffraction to um, exhaustive uh, study the, all the details, the structural details, and how um, all the undergoes all the phase transitions with the change in the temperature. And in particular, we would be, pay attention at the tilting and like the rotation of the octahedral system uh, in the lattice. Where we have to see what role the organic, organic um, molecule plays in the, within the lattice. And of course, this is important because um, since we have uh, changes in the structure and in the atoms and in the chemistry of our materials, uh, that would affect the band structure of uh, the system, which is um, very is correlated with the actual optoelectrical properties of our materials, which is what we want to uh, we want to see how it changes. So, in my first two months of my PhD. I spent three weeks uh, in Madrid, in the Instituto de Ciencia de Materiales. And um, most of my time there, I did some th synthesis of the samples that I was going to be using during my PhD. And we essentially used two different methods. The first one uh, is inverse temperature crystallization, uh, which is a um, typical uh, solution crystallization method. Uh, basically, you put the stoichiometric amounts of the reactants in uh, liquid, um, solvent 
And um, we have to keep in mind that it's an inverse ter temperature crystallization, meaning that it's less, the reactants are less, um, there's less solubility at higher temperatures, which is usually the opposite. But at the end of the, like, at the, end of the day, it translates to the, crystallize, uh, the crystals to be crystallized at higher temperatures than usual. And if we want to uh, do powder studies, we basically grind uh, the smaller crystals that we have. And if we have a good, like a good crystal um, big enough to do neutron scattering, then we pick a, the, the proper one to do it. And uh, we recently started doing samples with the ball mill, um, which is a mechanical, mechanical chemical synthesis project. So essentially you put the stoichiometric amounts of the reactants in this container with little balls, zirconia balls, and you put it in the ball mill and you make it run for a long period of time and, uh, and you end up with a, a perovskite powder perfectly crystallized, which is perfect for uh, these kind of experiments. Again, um, in the lab we use different techniques to previously characterize them before the ex neutron and x-ray experiments and uh, also to, we do some um, optoelectrical characterization, as I mentioned before. We do same images to see the topography of the powder and of course preliminary measurements to see if they're well crystallized and to have an idea of what we have at room temperature. And we also perform differential scanning calor cal calorimetry, which is uh, used to localize the temperatures um, where they, there's a change in the phase in our samples. Um, so that is uh, just an example of one of these curves. Uh, here you can see the, the different uh, changes in the slope, which means the different uh, transitions. Um, then we do uh, ultraviolet and visible spectroscopy um, to determine the band gap, and then we do uh, a few optoelectrical tests. And then, of course, uh, to do the um, to do the um, crystallography. Um, the crystallography research, I guess, is uh, very well known by most of us um, that we do uh, synchrotron X ray diffraction and neutron refraction experiments. So, in the first place, um, we use X ray diffraction to get, of course, um, extreme angular resolution uh, of patterns. And we can define the, perfectly the symmetry of our samples at any temperature that we want. Um, we get the um, crystallography information from, by doing a bit belt refinement. I hope, like, I don't know if any, like, every of, or every one of us knows what, what is this. Um, but just in case, uh, it's basically a method that uses uh, least squares. So we can try to um, make the theoretical spectrum match the um, experimental data points. Uh, once that is done, we, you can extract a lot of information about the crystal structure. But of course, synchrotron um, uh, X-ray diffraction is not enough to actually unveil the organic part of my um, crystals. Uh, for that, of course, we need neutrons. And although the, um, the neutron diffraction patterns have a lot of incoherent background, um, here at the LL, we have uh, the enough flux to get like um, spectral with a lot of the statistics to resolve the whole the structure. And that is done uh, with different Fourier map, where we can actually see the isosurfaces um, where there, were, there are atoms that were not considered in the, uh, in the model that we're usually starting from, which is usually a synchrotron model. So by doing this, we see the, where the hydrogens should be located. So with that, we can locate them and add them into our model and then refine the structure to get a complete, uh, a complete um, model perfectly refined. And uh, well, so far I've done uh, experiments uh, powder of, with powder in D20 and D2B and single crystal in D19 and D9. So um, now I'm going to be um, explaining um, three sets of data results for like three different uh, samples. And uh, I'm going to start off by explaining um, the uh, crystallographic features that we did with like these powder uh, hybrid uh, mixed pair of skites using bromine and chlorine. So we're going to see how the, um, so how adding chlorine to the pair of skite of uh, three brom bromine, uh, it changes as we keep uh, adding the chlorine. So um, right after we synthesize it, you can actually see already a difference, and that is because, um, what you see in the picture, 
um, the color is paler and paler as we add more chlorine. We take, take the samples to the SEM and we measure this image. And uh, in all cases, we get cubic type uh, microcrystals. However, it is quite obvious that we have a decrease in the size as we add more and more chlorine. And, uh, but well, anyway, in all the cases, all the samples were well crystallized. And, uh, and that is, we make sure that that is that way with X-ray diffraction in the lab. Um, however, I forgot to mention all the samples are synthesized in the regular wet uh, procedures in solution. So we take these samples to the synchrotron and we do a study of room temperature to see how the amount of chlorine in our sample changes uh, the crystal structure. So for all the cases, we have room tem we have uh, cubic uh, phases at uh, again, room temperature and we do the refinements um, uh, the Breedville refinements for all of them, but what we want to see is how this uh, changes depending on the composition. So here we have like a spectra with all the different samples used in this set. And we see that it changes in fact. Um, so we are going to see how the unit cell parameter in this cubic phase for all the samples changes as we increase the amount of chlorine. And in this case, as we expect, um, the unit cell parameter um, decreases as we increase uh, the, the chlorine amount. However, it's not a linear, it's not a linear uh, tendency. We then explore the different, different temperatures to see if we localize and determine other phase transitions. So in the first place, we have the, the sample that only has bromine, and we're able to localize the three phases um, first, the cubic phase at high temperatures, then tetragonal, and then orthorhom ortho orthorhombical at lowest temperatures. For the ones that are mixed um, halide, um, the, the mixed samples, we see there's no change. There's no change in the structure. It's cubic to 120K. And for the chlorine sample, we were not able to identify the tetragonal, which was already reported, the tetragonal phase. However, we did explore this uh, temperature range a little bit more to find out that instead of a diagonal phase, there was an extra, um, um, an, an extra um, orthorhombic phase. It's a little bit more complex, um, and you can actually see the complexity in the next slide, where we represented the unit cell parameters for um, this uh, sample in particular at different temperatures. So, um, the things that is a little bit complex because uh, there are several orthorhombic phases that they coexist, so it's a little bit confusing, and that's why in previously in previous uh, works it was thought to be an tetragonal phase. However, what is interesting is compare all the samples, um, the unit cell parameter variation for all the samples of the set. Um, it's very nice to see like how in the bromine purely bromine uh, sample we start from cubic structure, um, then tetragonal, and finally. Oh, for the samples that are mixed, um, there's cubic all the way, like, and for the and the last sample, there's the one that's a little bit more tricky. Um, it's the, the same, the same, the same tendency. I still hear people, Henry. I don't know. Well, um, however, now we've done like we have explored all the temperatures with the synchrotron X-ray radiation. Uh, we take our samples to um, D2B here at the ILL, and uh, as I mentioned before, it's a key part to actually unveil the organic structure in the crystals. So that is what we do. Uh, we measure all the samples at room temperature, and um, by doing and calculating different Fourier maps, we are able to see all the density, uh, the density that wasn't considered in our previous model for synchrotron. And what do we see? We see that the methyl ammonium evolves from uh, 110 to 100 as we add more and more chlorine. Moreover, uh, the methyl ammonium, um, as we increase the chlorine, um, is more localized. Um, so all of these, so we're able to resolve um, all the methyl ammonium structures. And we add this information to the Ritzfeld refinements, and uh, we are able to um, do like the whole complete refinement of the X structure with the uh, neutron diffraction uh, data. Here again, you can see all the incoherent background that we have, but again, we are able to refine the whole structure uh, perfectly. 
So from all, so this is just an example, but of course we get this for all the samples and uh, we extract a lot of crystallographic information. But one of these crystallographic information is the unit cell parameter. We do this for all the samples. And again, we see that the um, unit cell parameter um, decreases as we increase the value of like, the amount of chlorine in our samples. Um, what is interesting about this is that we have related the amount, the chemical, the chemical structure. So as much, um, so as we increase the chlor chlorine, um, we have decreased the, the structure, the structure of the, um, of the uh, unit cell. Um, and that has led to um, localization of the methyl ammonium units. So finally, once we have done this um, full complete um, uh, structure analysis, we go to the optological properties. And we, with ultraviolet and visible absorption, uh, measurements, we uh, are able to identify what is the band gap for every, um, every sample that we synthesize. And what we find is that as much, like, um, the more chlorine that we put in the sample, the larger the band gap, the band gap is, but in, not in a linear way, way, which is, it reminds us a little bit how, um, how the, um, the unit cell parameter uh, decays as well, in a non-linear way. Um, that well, the thing that um, the band gap increases as we increase the the uh, chlorine content is not very practical for solar cells because we would like to have uh, lower values for the for the band gap. But always good to always good to know how we're tuning the properties of the perovskites only by adding more chlorine. However, we focus on the on the the most convenient. Um, uh, perovskite for solar cells applications, and we do some other tests to see how they respond under light, uh, finding that there's a maximum of around 100 nanometers of the response. Uh, the, the more power density power, the more uh, current that we're going to have. And also we study and we consider the photocurrent response. So uh, now I'm going to be, uh, oops, sorry. I'm going to be explaining the second set of results that I have. Um, that is that um, because the ball mill um, is usually used to um, synthesize uh, powder inorganic samples, we decided that maybe we, the organic um, part of our perovskite could be changed uh, to cesium atoms, and that's what we did. Uh, we synthesized it in the mechanosynthesis, so in the mechanosynthesis project in the in the ball mill, and we got in fact uh, very well crystallized samples. As you can see in the picture, there's bigger and smaller piece, uh, pieces, but if you sit in, the, in this, um, this picture, it has like smaller agglomerations, which of like grains, and uh, we think that were um, single crystal, uh, smaller pieces of single crystals. And we did confirm with uh, some laboratory X-ray diffraction measurement, because the samples were very well crystallized and they, um, and they seem perfect to do a study on neutron or X-ray diffraction. Um, I also have to mention that these samples are stable at orthorhombic phase at room temperature, and that is because of the cesium um, has a small, smaller uh, ionic ready. So if you remember the um, tolerance factor that I mentioned before, it will be smaller at room temperature, making that is and be um, stable in the orthorhombic phase. So uh, once we've done these preliminary um, tests, we go to our neutron diffraction experiments. So in D20, we explore how um, the perovskite would, would change and to, would down to 4K. So we explore the orthorhombical, the orthorhombical phase a little bit. So what do we see here? We see that, um, of course, for some cases, so we increase the temperature, the parameters of the lattice will increase, which is something that you think it, mm, more or less uh, normal. However, there's uh, a negative thermal expansion, so the least temperature, the higher um, the, um, the parameter it is. It is this is not um, the first time that happens in perovskites, however, it's not a common behavior. We can also compare the volume of the, of the unit cell uh, as we decrease the temperature, and we do see that at 20K, there's like a plateau thingy, and that could be due because of a uh, compromise between of like the increase of the, oof. 
uh, of the um, A and C parameter and the decrease of the B parameter. Um, this is again information about the low temperature phase, so 4K. Uh, here you have a lot of information that we can extract for all the refinements that we do at low temperatures with neutrons. And uh, however, we want to see how the, the, um, the perovskite evolves um, as we decrease the temperature. So in order to do that, in order to see the tilting of the octahedra that I was mentioning before, uh, we do see, um, like we do check the measures, like the distances between some of the atoms. So for the case of the, um, of the lead and the bromine, brom bromine uh, this distance is kept, is kept constant. However, the, the cesium and the bromine uh, is higher as we increase the temperature. That means that the, the octahedra is in fact, um, is in fact uh, being rotated. On the other hand, we have the atomic displacement parameters. Um, and we see that for the first case of the least, uh, they state remains more or less constant. And for the case of the cesium, uh, it increases with temperature which is something that it was a little bit it's expected um, because of the the lead is in a strong covalent bond and the fission isn't we explore different uh the different phases with a mixture of neutron and x-ray diffraction experiments um so because the at room temperatures is um also orthorhombical uh, we would reach the cubic at higher temperatures so we will go up to around uh, 1800 uh, degrees uh, Kelvin. Um, so you were not able to localize the tetragonal, the tetragonal phase. However, we were able to do a full refinement, refinement of the synchrotron X-ray data um, at the cubic phase and at the, um, the one at lowest temperatures. So of course, from all these refinements we can do, and we can extract a lot of information. However, I didn't want to like overload this um, but it is worth mentioning that uh, with this um, experimental uh, synthesis process, the, the data that we have um, obtained is that the, in general, the unit cell parameters are uh, smaller than in other processes. Um, so that could be related to the, the synthesis with the ball mill. It'll have to be further uh, research. Again, uh, we will do some optical optolytical properties. We determine the band gap, which is smaller than it was reported before with other techniques, um, which is good for solar cell applications. And again, the responsivity uh, for different wavelengths and the response, which are good enough. However, although I've uh, talked about two different sets of, um, of samples, the MAPI that I mentioned in the, in the motivation of the project is still the better option as a solar cell in, as a solar cell, as a perovskite solar cell because of all the properties that it, that it has. So we thought, okay, if we were able to um, synthesize these samples, the cesium samples, all inorganic with a mobile, although it hasn't been done before, maybe we can try to do a, an inorganic organic um, perovskite powder, crystallized powder with the mill as well. With the, with, for this for this kind of perovskite, so we tried and and it turned out very well because we we synthesized this uh, mappy perovskite um, with the superior stability, so it wouldn't degrade even after months. Um, so we took um, uh, these samples to the same to the same, and we did some image, images as we see here, and we see that. It is in fact a very well crystallized. We have uh, crystals with sharp edges. Then we took it to extra diffraction in the lab, and again, very well, well crystallized. Um, so this is something that we're very happy about. And we go and study these uh, samples, so promising samples, to neutron and neutron diffraction experiments. So we so we measured this in D20. We measured room temperature. And um, and uh, 180 K, which is corresponds to the tetragonal phase, and we do see after, of course, after doing all the processes and all the data treatment that I mentioned before, uh, taking into account that there's incoherent background, but we can mm, solve it perfectly. Uh, at the end, we come to the conclusion that there's a lot of the disorder, so the methylammonium is very, it's very disordered. There's a lot of possible orientations 
However, this disorder decreases as we decrease the temperature. Um, but this is something that had been previously reported in other um, synthesis proce pro uh, processes of, of the sample. So it's not something that was surprising. And then we started the lower temperature phase, which is the orthorhombic phase. Um, uh, we studied this at three more temperatures, I think. Uh, but essentially, um, we we came to describe the the perf sky perfectly. Um, we did the difference Fourier maps because the samples, the models that we used previously, uh, did not consider all the all the additional methyl ammonium positions. However, you see here how um, there was a missing methyl uh, methyl ammonium molecule that we had not considered. And um, after you define it, uh, how the whole system is perfectly defined and refined. Um, and uh, yes, so we got a complete picture of um, these two phases of the birth states with a new um, method of synthesizing them. It is important to see, to, to say that um, the lower the temperatures, the more localized the methyl ammonium, the methyl ammonium is. So here is like perfectly, well here in both cases are perfectly localized and because it only rotates, it doesn't, like the carbon and the nitrogen don't have uh, extra, extra positions, but uh, this rotation also decreases as we decrease the temperature. So again, and finally, we um, do some optoelectrical characterization and uh, with, this, um, with this new uh, sample. And uh, again, we find that the, the best responsibility is for uh, wavelengths of 100 and 820 nanometers, which means that um, the band gap is a little bit rough sifted, so it's not technically as good as the, the, the previously mappy um, with other techniques. However, the rest of the, the rest of the samples, the rest of the, um, of the properties that we tested show uh, similar behavior. So I'm very happy, we're very happy in general with this, with these results. And that is basically it for my results part. Uh, and just to finish up a little bit, uh, just a few conclusions. That is that uh, the neutron diffraction techniques, of course, are uh, essential to unveil um, all the secrets that the perovskites have, especially when we have organic uh, molecules. And then for the series of the methyl ammonium, bromine, and chlorine, um, we did study how the methyl ammonium units uh, change through temperature and how uh, the different um, cells affect the localization of the methyl ammonium unit. And then we focus on this uh, sample um, that in, in general has shown like great optoelectrical properties to be a potentially good solar cell. And then we found that the MAPI perovskite uh, prepared by mobiling uh, exhibits a superior stability. And so in no time of degradation after several months to exposed, exposed to humid air which is uh, very good. And then just to finish up, just to mention, I wanted to mention that I, of course, we faced a lot of problems. One of them is, of course, I only saw these samples, but I, we prepared a little bit more and that were not stable and we struggled a little bit with that. Then we did some crystal, single crystal experiments and that, um, of course, they twin when you go down in temperature, that is tricky. And then at the moment, we're trying to identify new, a new structural phase that we're not able to properly identify. So yeah, but essentially we try to contribute to, with novel experimental evidence that facilitates a more reasonable design of hybrid perovskites with tunable properties for solar cell technologies. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, um, Carmen. Um, that was a very nice presentation. Well, there's a, a comment from uh, Alexei Vorobyev uh, saying this was a very uh, a good uh, talk. You can see it? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Asking uh, why, perhaps it was in the interest of simplicity, you didn't uh, show references. Yes, uh, so all the figures and so I've, everything I show is uh, from my group. And uh, I did have like an extra slide, but I think I opened the, the wrong presentation with all the um, all the papers, but I put it at the end and I didn't show. Okay, go ahead and respond to it, um, uh, Carmen. I, I mean, there's so many. 
Yeah, you can just respond one by one. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 of course. Um, um, so that one of the questions is why we go down to um, 120K. I, th I think that's the uh, question. And what we want to like, of course, we want to see like how the perf sky changes uh, through like the, the most like temperature range that we can and see what is happening and why like, what are the the physical like the structural features that make uh, all, like the phase transit to one into another? And then um, the next one is from Franket Fragneto. Oh, the how does the synchrotron radiation compare with the in-house X-ray diffractometer? Well, of course, the high resolution that we get from the synchrotron is in doesn't compare to the uh, diffraction. Yeah, no, this I understand. I just wonder if um, for your particular system, so the X-ray diffractometer can be good enough or it's... No, because uh, sometimes we have uh, um, very subtle uh, phase transitions that we're not able... Actually, I'm struggling at the moment with one that I'm not able... <laughs> that wasn't seen with the... Uh, with X-ray diffraction, but with the synchrotron, we localize it. So I also had actually another another quick question that I didn't write down. The DSC measurements so you did them in uh, Spain in your own yes. university, okay, yes. like the UV and the SM. Yes, yes. Um, I, I think I was supposed to go there because the quarantine didn't allow. I couldn't do more, but. And, thank you. Uh, I think. Um, Go ahead and proceed to the next written questions if you want. All right, all right. So apparently, for real cells, you need thin films and not bulk materials. Um, is this trumper? No, like they, they're two completely like they're I, as far as I know, they're two completely different things. One is a three D a three D solar cell, and one is a thin film two D. Um, if I, don't I, know just, if I understood if, well, if I could intervene and maybe clarify, otherwise Alexei can tune in. It's related to a question I wanted to ask: is um, whether or not uh, you can use polycrystals as for the solar cells. Now, three D or two D depends on the thickness relative to some uh, length uh, characteristic length, which uh, makes it two uh, D if it's thin enough and. Um, I didn't have the impression that solar cells were um, considered to be 2D for the electron transport, for example. So I think that's the sense of the question from Alexei, perhaps he could clarify. But another question that I had was, can you uh, make a polycrystalline film of a few microns of thickness, for example, and use that as a solar cell, or do you need to have relatively big single crystals uh, that are thin, in, uh, in the, as is the case now for the silicon solar cells? Um, so I'm not really sure about the um, architecture of the solar cell with perovskite. Like I have the schemes like right now in uh, like in my desk, but um, I don't think it's thin film. It's, I think it's a little bit larger. It has a lot of layers of different materials depending on the perovskite that you use and so on. But I don't think I think it's uh, larger than, than 2D. Okay, so it's larger than 2D, I and think it's so. probably. It can be polycrystalline with uh, grain boundaries. Yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so the next question is from uh, Kim Lawrence. You know, I just want, I just thought I'd intervene with chemistry. Uh, uh, just um, interested what sort of masses you were using to make these powder samples. Because wh when I did uh, ball milling in the past for double perovskites, I found that I was losing uh, a bit of the samples through the ball milling because mm -hmm. obviously it gets. Uh, trapped inside the, the ball mill and has to be acid clean. So just that, that was a simple question. <laughs> so we use, um, I think like I remember we did like, we got like a gram and a half, 1.5 grams. And that worked so far. So. <laughs> However, if you change like the, the, the number of balls that you put, and then like the amount of time, like everything changes slightly. So that's, I think, something we need to... Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely found, I think I, I was losing uh, up to 
100 milligrams of sample per uh, milling and wow. then it, it was dependent on the uh the how many balls and the sort of things in the process mm -hmm. okay well, okay the next you. question is from vitali uh yes hello <clears throat> so uh you said that the uh, uh with some of your samples uh, which you prepared with full milling yeah uh, you made the uh, xrd uh scan and you have found no contamination uh, <laughs> And my question is, which material did you use uh, for the bowl milling? I mean, the, the bowls are made of uh, which material? Sorry? Uh, <clears throat> uh, so for the bowl milling, you can use yes. bowls made of different... Uh, uh, different material. materials, yes. Uh, which one did you use? I, I don't remember, but I, I... Okay, so I just want to say that the uh, XRD uh, so in your sample, you have a lead, and which is uh, rather heavy. And in XRD, you may just not see the contamination by the bone milling, because sometimes there is some contamination, like one of one to eight <clears> percent, <throat> by the material of the poles, and uh, from the <clears throat> from all the parts of this bone mill, and you may just not see it in the uh, XRD part because it just uh, the elements are much lighter, lighter than the elements in your uh, in your specimen. So I well, I don't know I don't know how to answer this. Yeah, maybe I, I think I can maybe make a helpful comment. Um, your slide showed that you were using zirconia uh, ball uh, balls. Ah uh, yes. And um, I thought about that. I thought about what Vitaly is saying, but I believe that zirconia, which is zirconium oxide, is very hard. And so this is a question of hardness. Um, and so the zirconia will scratch the perovskite uh, component, but not the opposite. So I doubt that you will get scratches on the zirconia. In other words, contaminate uh, uh, the sample with particles of zirconia because of the big difference in hardness, as far as I understand. Thank you, Henry. No problem. <laughs> Um, and Oscar says uh, that, in my opinion, why is the origin of the high stability of the new synthetic wood sample mapping? So, um, like, I'm not 100% sure, but I do think it's that because in the process of baking the bulb meal, like in the bulb meal milling process, the, there are less, there's less um, organic uh, methyl ammonium, so there are more defects in the sample. Okay, and then Laura actually was uh, correcting me. Uh, she has more experience with ball milling than, than me. <laughs> and um, she's saying that even uh, if you have hard balls, you can have some contamination. So one has to be careful. But zirconium, zirconia, I believe, I don't know its atomic number. I'm not a chemist. I think it's sort of, sort of in the middle of the periodic table. So it would uh, probably show up on uh, x-ray. Uh, Actually, but, uh, zirconium has a periodic number of 40 and lead has 200. So uh, and they are much different. So you got about a factor of five once you take the square. Uh, concerning the stability of the, sam the samples, I think that, I mean, we think that it might be probably due also to the microstructure, which is uh, different. So when you have a smaller, if you want a smaller particles or particle size, your number of defects is bigger. And so uh, probably the migration of um, uh, water or whatsoever is uh, more difficult. So that may, might increase the stability, but I mean, it's just uh, an answer. I mean, it's, uh, we, we suppose it might be this, but it's, uh, we don't know yet. Does annealing help if you anneal the samples after ball milling in terms of contamination or Chris, uh, defect uh, concentration? We haven't done it. Um, I'll just make a comment while we're waiting for another question perhaps to come. I was quite impressed with the uh, Fourier transform different uh, difference plots. Um, is that yes. something new to be able to do that in 3D to actually see where you're missing hydrogen atoms? That was- I don't know if it's new. 
I don't know if it's new. I've, I've learned in this year. Okay. But that was uh, impressive. I didn't know that was possible at that level. Okay. Well, it seems like everyone is happy. And I think uh, Carmen will remain available by, uh, by email or Zoom if you want to discuss this uh, further with her. So um, I'm going to just uh, ask everyone to thank you again. Uh, since I'm actually activated, I'm going to clap uh, for real. So thank you, Carmen, for that presentation.